commit. I actually think that there are three tasks, naming racism, asking how is racism operating here, and then organizing and strategizing to act, which will uh, propel us toward, you know, well, actually those were the elements of a national campaign against racism that I actually launched in 2016 when I was president of the American Public Health Association. And so the naming is necessary, especially in the context of widespread racism denial, which is our national context. So we have to be willing to go beyond just talking about race or diversity, equity, inclusion, be belonging. You know, there's all of this now is becoming D-E-I-B, you know, so diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. But we need to go beyond that, beyond cultural competence or even structural competence or implicit or unconscious bias or even explicit or conscious bias. So in order to say the whole word racism, the ism piece is the important piece, the system piece, um, that has been a scary thing. So the, the first thing is to make it not scary, right? So we have to name racism because it exists, but in the context of widespread denial, if we never say the word, then people, we're complicit with the denial. But once we say the word, many people act as if oh my God, you're trying to examine me closely and see exactly how racist I am. Yeah. Or you're trying to divide the room into who's racist and who's not. And whenever I say the word racism, I'm talking about a system and I'm not trying to do any of those other things. So that's why it's important for people to understand, yes, we've got to say the word racism because it exists. It's foundational in our nation's history. It continues to exist. It has profoundly negative impacts on the health and well-being of the nation. We've got to talk about it but once you say the word, you don't want people to flee. You want them to engage. Right. Dean, you're nodding on this. And I know you have, uh, you've written a lot about unpacking uh, our, our culture and, and the, the roots of racism. Would you want to pick up on that? Well, I agree with Dr. Jones wholeheartedly. I think she put uh, out some very important ideas about the scariness of, of this conversation. And I, I, something I'm noticing more and more as we dive more deeply into this discussion, uh, you know, it's, in a way, some people have called this like a second generation discussion post civil rights, um, you know, a, kind of a new reckoning of how we need to engage the issues of structural racism in, in our society. Uh, I think before we were focused heavily on, on sort of individuals and um, you know, not discriminating against individuals and not being racist ourselves, um, which is important, that work had to be done. Uh, but as I've often said, it plays into a, a tendency in American culture to individualize everything and to uh, ignore systemic problems or to react negatively when we are talking about a systemic problem by individualizing the problem. So, the scariness piece that Dr. Jones is talking about for me is I talk about as we start talking about structural racism or systemic racism, you make a point about it and the person you're talking to responds, but I am mm. not, or but it's, I don't mm. do. And we haven't even, we're not talking about you. <laughs> we're talking about us, you know, we're talking about a structure. Yes, we're all involved in it, but we have to stop individualizing the problem or we're never going to get to the second order problem about systemic and structural racism. And so we need to kind of demystify that piece so that we can all participate in uh, you know, the breaking down of the structures. I actually would like to respond to that because even now when people say systemic racism or structural racism, it's as if they were distinguishing it from something else, the individual racism that you're talking about. But in, in my understanding, racism is the system and then it manifests you know I, I talk about these three levels the internal institutionalized or structural but then the personally mediated which i don't even call interpersonal see like if you talk about it interpersonal it's between people but this is i call it personally mediated because it's a system mediated through people and then internalized so even this notion that everybody now is getting so fancy and they're talking about systemic racism or structural racism they're finally getting this idea it's still, they're making it as a type of racism when in fact racism is the system. <laughs> you know, that, right, <laughs> it's like saying Kamara Kamara as opposed to, you know, uh, 
you know, Betty Kamara, you know, like, like, come, <laughs> you know, there is no Betty, you know, Kamara is Kamara, Kam you know, racism is the system. Right. And so, um, but to the individual piece that you're talking about, I know that you don't want to hear me spew seven things right now, but I have identified seven barriers that I used to call cultural barriers or societal barriers to achieving health equity that I now recognize as the values targets for anti-racism action. And the first one, the key one is in this nation, we are so narrowly focused on the individual that it makes systems and structures either invisible or seemingly irrelevant. It also makes our self-interest very narrowly defined and all. I have seven of these. And my question now is how do we, and I'll share those seven during my talk, so I don't need to share them as part of this interview unless you're really interested, unless, you want to, unless we want to go back and forth, you know, like saying, oh yeah, I like that one too, and this is where I go, and oh, you forgot this one, you know, like we can go, because I already, I love you, <laughs> you know, so we can, we can, we can you know, go. But, um, but I'm wondering how do we, so I have seven of them, I'll just say them right now, just so okay. I'll put them on the table. So the narrow focus on the, I'll say the, the most important thing about each one. The narrow focus on the individual, which makes systems and structures either invisible or irrelevant, seemingly irrelevant. The fact that we're ahistorical, so we act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. Third is our endorsement of the myth of meritocracy, that if you work hard, you will make it. Understanding that most people who have made it have worked hard, but not everybody who's made it has worked hard. We have very prominent examples of that. But even given that most people who have made it have worked hard, there are many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field. So we can go deep on that. The fourth is our endorsement of the myth of a zero-sum game, that if you gain, I lose. So we could go deep on that. The fifth is our limited future orientation and the parts of the future that each of us can touch and influence today are the children and the planet. And we in this country have a disregard for the children and a usurious relationship with the planet. So of course we could go very deep on that. The sixth is the myth, endorsement of the myth of American exceptionalism. That this, in this country, we're so special, so unique, so ordained by God, you know, we can't even learn from what's happening in other countries. And the seventh is actually a foundational one, which is white supremacist ideology, which is not just a um, lightning rod term. It's a description of a false idea of a hierarchy of human valuation by race with white people at the top in the norm. And of course, I have a lot to say about that. So, but those are the seven. And I'm sure there are more. I mean, actually, I've been thinking about biological determinism. Do I break that out as an eight? Or is that part of white supremacist ideology and this false idea? But all of that is to say, so now I have identified at least seven or eight. And then you guys, each of you, you know, could, could add right. another one or two, right? How do we address those? Absolutely. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I would just say, you know, you saw me nodding. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, 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 yes. So um, I think, you know, and several of those that you mentioned are so critical for um, law, for instance. I mean, you're, you're looking at it from the sort of the healthcare perspective, and I'm looking at it from the legal perspective. But again, each of those things has something very important to say about why certain legal approaches can do some things, but not others. Right. So when you look at the law ahistorically, and we're having that kind of conversation right now, right, you know, we're looking at a Supreme Court justice and there's this talk of, you know, originalism versus uh, other ways of, of thinking about constitutional law. You can't freeze time. Right. But the past informs the present. And, um, you know, if we're not sort of engage in an honest assessment of the past and how our laws were formed and what the assumptions were about the laws at that time and whether or not we want to carry those assumptions over to the future, we're going to end up with some very distorted results in how we enforce the laws. Uh, so yeah, hist history is critical. And one of the things we're dealing with right now is sort of this emerging conversation about things that frankly a lot of white people in this country didn't know or at least claim not to have known. Uh, about their own history, about the history of this country, and about things that, and for a lot of people of color, were just obvious. Mm -hmm. Things that we live with and see that, you know, our white fellow citizens have been blind to or don't see. 
And of course, if you see them, you're gonna have a very different understanding of whether or not you're gonna value something as positive or negative or whether or not you wanna keep it. So, uh, you know, just to give you a quick example, I was just reading about how the national anthem came to be, mm. you know, and how it was written in the context of, you know, slaveholders who were angry uh, with the British uh, for offering to free slaves during the War of 1812 who came over to their side <laughs> uh, to fight. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of stanzas in that uh, poem that are very pro-slavery, very pro, ultimately became pro-Confederacy. I mean, so do people feel the same way about the national anthem when they learn that information? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I mean, I don't want to get off farther afield, but yeah, all of those things are so critical. And American individualism and exceptionalism is a huge issue we deal with in the law. I mean, the idea that our constitution is the only constitution that's really the one that can be, you know, I mean, wait a minute, can't we learn from mm -hmm. how other countries have thought through democracy and democratic institutions and democratic rights and privileges and responsibilities? We don't think of responsibilities in the American context because we're so fixated on rights. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes to our individualism. So all of these things I think are so critical and they cross fields. Mm -hmm. And they bury us in habits and of mind and practices and structures that are, uh, you know, limiting our ability to to unpack the problem of racism. I would love to get into if we have time, um, you know, since in higher education and and uh, law and medicine, uh, different approaches. What what could work? What could be applicable? But if we could even just go back to the idea of American exceptionalism and the fa how foundational racism is. Um, if, if either of you would like to uh, talk about that, because I, th I think that is an area that, that many white people are just really learning about, like how what we're, we're founded on. Well, so I wouldn't even put that as American exceptionalism, although it is true. I mean, that is true, but that's usually when people are talking about American exceptionalism, they are celebrating the, the specialness of it and not the exceptional uh, way that we were founded by the taking of land from indigenous people and then enslaving, you know, you know, others and all of that. So, um, so ask the question again, because, because, because honestly, with the American exceptionalism, it's like, we're so special that the usual rules don't apply to us. We don't even need to know what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, and we can expect other people to speak English <laughs> when we go there, you know, like all of that kind of stuff, as well as we can't learn from other countries. We can't even learn from other countries in terms of truth and reconciliation stuff or, you know, um, the reparations types of moves that other countries have made that, 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 that even if we thought that we might need to make those kinds of moves, apologies, that our situation is so different and so special that there's nothing we can learn from other countries. Um, but I don't think that any of the people who hold American to be exceptional would think it, that it had anything negative to do with that, <laughs> you know. But I think it is important to look at it from both sides, right? The negative and yes. the positive, because yes. you're right. Who thinks of it almost all exclusively in positive terms? It's usually the people who are, you know, blinded by their privilege, usually people who are white usually people who are in power, who see the exceptionalness of America as almost in totally positive terms, whereas others, you know, well, what is one of the things that is exceptional about the United States is the, is chattel slavery and it's, you know, disfiguring impact on the, how this nation came to be. And the, for, from a perspective of a legal scholar, the constant compromises that were made with the slave holding South to mm. keep the country together at all costs, and then after the Civil War, additional compromises that were made to, at the cost of rights for free blacks. Mm -hmm. You know, those things were expendable in the interest in the interest of preserving the Union after the Civil War. Um, and so, when you think of our Union as being bought at the price of the rights of freed men and women, and the deaths of all kinds of people during the Civil War. I mean, that puts a different spin on our exceptionalism. So I think those kinds of conversations and that kind of historical accuracy is often missing uh, when we think about, you know, the exceptional nature of our American experiment. It is exceptional in some positive ways too, but, you know, 
if you don't have both in the conversation, you're, you're creating a fairy tale, not a, not a real narrative about the history of a nation. And as you talk about expendable people for some other project right now, uh, with COVID-19, I mean, clearly, uh, it's, if you just look at the timing of when it became clear that, you know, Black people and Indigenous people and Pacific Islander people and Latinx people were being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, when that became clear was exactly when the President of the United States started saying, free Minnesota, free Michigan, free Virginia, right? And that's when all of the governors, Republican governors, started reopening. And that's what we have now because the, the misinterpretation was because people of color were disproportionately impacted that they were going to be the only ones impacted. And there was a feeling, and I think there still is a feeling among people who might be denying the seriousness of this infection, that yes, we can just let everybody get infected. Yes, yeah, some people will die, but it won't be the good people or real people. Even in, in some of the states where there are meatpacking plants and there were um, the, the rise in COVID-19 in the first wave, and uh, people, white people, they were saying, oh, but it's not affecting real people. I mean, that was a real quote um, because it was affecting immigrant people who were working in the meatpacking plants. So, so this notion of, them, of we and they and how racism structures that has been used, has been used to divide poor white people from their own interests, truth be told, right? And has been used to, to make a we, they thing and create an expendable class, which doesn't benefit the poor white people, it benefits the landholders, it benefits all of these other people. It, it's, it's like historic. And so then, oh, oh, something just happened, but I'm still here, I see. Yep, you're still uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, it, just as you were talking about how the interest of recently emancipated people was, yeah still happening all the time. Mm. You made another point about us Americans not being interested in what's happening in the other parts of the world. And I think this has an impact on how we've approached COVID too, because we have, mm -hmm. you know, studiously denied mm -hmm. the superior practices that are being used abroad mm -hmm. to control this disease with better success. So all we have to do is, you know, copy uh, our peer nations yes. in their response, and we would see a much better result, but we refuse, absolutely refuse to do that. I think for the reasons Dr. Jones was saying, you know, well, the people who are dying here really aren't, they don't really quite matter quite so much. I mean, we're not all in this together, right? Right, we're not all in this together. The dehumanization, the white supremacist ideology, which results in dehumanization of people of color. And the, the, there's something else about COVID, which is a very individual Take. So our take on it, so yes, we're not learning from other nations, and we're treating this pandemic as if it were an individual medical care issue as opposed to a public health issue, which also is really messing with our, with our response. And we're so, it, that shows up in how we treat testing. It shows up in how we've been thinking about reopening the schools. You know, well, the kids don't seem to be getting sick. No, but they're vectors, right? And it shows up in our strong, strong interest in therapeutics and vaccines, as opposed to the public health strategies that we know are working in other countries. We know that if you pay people to stay home, right, that that works. We know mask mandates and mask wearing works and social distancing and hand washing. We, we have what we need to control the pandemic, but instead we're so narrowly focused on the individual and have even made COVID-19 an individual medical care problem, that we act like public health had nothing to do with it. Yes, exactly. But even before, and, and, and sure this is obviously one of the reasons why certain populations are more affected by, by COVID-19, but what I was going to ask was, even before COVID-19, uh, the disparities, the racism, um, I, I'd, love for, I'd love for you both to address uh, the um, the manifestations of racism in your individual fields, uh, law and higher education and medicine, even before COVID-19. Dean Rujo, you want to go first? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, um, you know, you mean just, I guess that gets back to this whole issue of structures, right? And what we see in the law is that there are legal rules, legal systems in play that when left alone, because they were created with the assumption that everyone is entering into an engagement with the legal system on, a, on the basis of equality, mm -hmm. and equality that is false, um, the outcomes 
reflect reflect the inequality, but no one wants to address, uh, you know, those basic the, the basic foundational inequalities because they want to cling to the notion that the law is is uh, you know a system that is uh, being exercised on the basis of equality. Now, you know, I think amongst legal scholars, the, that's typically something associated with more conservative views, like, you know, this procedural, if we have a fair procedure, a fair process, the outcomes will be fair, but we know that that's, that's not true. And we're, that's why we see all these disparities uh, from facially neutral uh, systems like the criminal justice system or the, uh, you know, the healthcare system, which we'll get to, the, uh, the, the wealth in inequality, educational disparities, all of those are gonna produce legal outcomes that are disparate because we have been unwilling to address the root causes, the root inequalities, which will force obviously some people to give up some things that they have gained through what they believe to have been a procedurally neutral system. But that's the problem, right? The system, which allocated gains was not neutral. So the people who have claimed many of those gains, you could argue, have claimed them from, you know, a, 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 as a, Elizabeth Warren would say, a rigged system. Um, and, um, or as some would say, from the fruit of a poison tree. You know, in law, we talk about the fruit of the poison tree in evidence. And so if the tree is poisonous, the fruit is poisonous. So, um, you know, and we need, uh, we need to plant some new trees. Uh, so that's hard to do, but I think we're finally reckoning with it because I mean, it's just become so blatantly obvious. COVID's making it obvious. Police brutality and violence is making it obvious that people are not being treated fairly, that the system does not produce justice uh, in its outcomes because the system is distorted by racism. So so you made me think of two things. The first has to do with when I first learned that with regard to like the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Health and Human Services that you had to prove intent, that impact, differential impact was not enough, that, that in many legal things you have to prove intent. And so, so that, that's because if that were not there, then disparate impact would, would have more weight. So that's the first yeah, thing that I, right. I'm just sort of interested in. But then you just said, and, and I've lost it. What was the last thing you said? It was so interesting. What was the last thing? Oh, about the, the not, procedural fairness, uh, producing uh, disparate oh. oh, the fruit of the poison tree. <laughs> fruit of the poison tree. Oh my gosh, it was not like- produce justice in um, something be <laughs> Um, oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. The outcomes or something. Yeah, yeah. What it is is so. Then you were saying, "Oh, with COVID nineteen, now we're seeing it." We get, yeah. Like so, we saw it with COVID nineteen. We we've seen it. We saw it, you know, acutely with you know all the black folks on the roofs after Hurricane Katrina and the levees breaking. Like so, we've seen this. Like oh, something's differential going on here by race. What could it be? Right. We've had that kind of insight many times. We are already normalizing the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. Just the way we've normalized the differences in infant mortality rate, just as we've normalized the differences in maternal mortality rate, or even the differences in diabetes prevalence or all of these you know, pre-existing conditions, they are now just like normal. And the, way I, the reason I say we're normalizing it is because we're not talking about it every day anymore, even though the differences are just as stark. And if you do a, an age-adjusted, look, the, what looks like a 2.3 times excess mortality rate for blacks compared to whites from COVID-19. If you look at the differences in the age structures of the white population, which is older because they're not, you know, other people are dying off earlier, right? And then you also look at how people are getting exposed. It's a four times black-white difference. So, so, but we're not talking about that. We've normalized it. So I am not as I don't think that COVID-19 is going to do for us what at first, when the shock, when the black and brown bodies were piling up so fast that they couldn't be ignored or normalized, right? When that shock factor wore off, I think we're just on to the next, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. what that is a, 
serious fear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It, you know, like we saw racism. Well, so, okay, so here, this is for, for you with the forum, right? For you in, as, as the dean of the law school. For me with my national campaign against racism, I am intent that six months from now, people won't be like, oh, well, that sure was a time of promise. Oh, well, you know what I'm saying without, and we wouldn't have gone there. So the national campaign against racism that I launched as APHA president, I'm sure I'm intent, as long as I'm alive, that's still going to be a national campaign against racism for the nation. You know that now there are 131 jurisdictions, so five states, I think 26 counties and 80, no, it has to be 46 counties and 80 cities have made formal declarations of racism as a public health crisis. Right. The first one was directly over three years out of my work as APHA president. Like, and I didn't even take credit for it until somebody said, Kamara, this is because of what you did in, in that national campaign. The, the last one, the 131st, they don't know from Kamara Jones, but this is the importance of agenda setting, right? To have a national campaign against racism. It's important for people to put these stakes in the sand, but if, if we just say a thing, then this is how I've been putting it these days. You're going to hear this at the talk again. But you know that, 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 that the somnolence of racism denial is so seductive, right? That if we just say a thing in six months, we'll forget why we said that thing. And that's why we have to move to action. So I guess what I'm saying is, so, so that's one thing. I just want to know, how can we move, how can we take out of the law the necess necessity for intent, for example. How mm -hmm. can we put differential impact as evidence of a bad system? <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? How can we go to, the, to what we're seeing, the differences in, in incarceration rates, the differences in education levels, the differences in wealth, the differences in, in all of these things, in health status. How can we use those things as evidence for moving forward in the law? That's a great question. And I think it comes down to how we think about rights and responsibilities. And uh, I, I'll try to make this kind of not too legally, but um, the, and I have some colleagues who are doing wonderful work in this, but many other democratic countries recognize in their constitutions certain rights that we do not, economic and social rights being paramount ones, so that people have a right to equality in education. They have a right to housing. And so when those things are constituted as rights, and it's not always easy to actualize, I don't wanna oversimplify it, but I think it is important that they're at least recognized, um, the law has to do some work in trying to figure out how to you know, realize those rights, how to make them, uh, you know, sort of meaningful in practice, not just in theory. And so I think you do start to see better outcomes, which is partially why I think you see in, you know, places like Europe, these more advanced social welfare protections for all people that guarantee them certain things that in the United States are not guaranteed. Uh, and why you see you know, even in the face of a lot of, you know, unrest and maybe even some hostilities to say immigrants, the immigrants are still provided for in ways that we will not provide for uh, undocumented immigrants, immigrants in this country. Another uh, concept that comes out of other constitutions and other democracies are, are a stronger sense of community responsibility. So, uh, you know, we talk about, um, you know, liberty and, uh, you know, um, the, uh, uh, you know, and property rights and, you know, keeping the government off our back. Um, well, the French talk about fraternity. That's a constitutional concept, you know, which, you know, Pope uh, Francis has actually talked more about in his most recent encyclical. I mean, the constant legalizing the notion that we are all have responsibilities to one another um, as you know, members of the same community. That's something that's very foreign to American law. And, uh, and I think it's, we're starting to see what that means 
for how disparities uh, continue to exist in our, in our country unaddressed because we have not figured out how to legalize the kinds of things that where we share, <laughs> where we share resources, where we try to fix disparities that we know create disparate outcomes and we know undermine equality undermine our legal, legal concept that we all share. Equality is a concept that all democracies share, but we have ignored the, the impact of disparate outcomes when it comes to that, whereas other countries recognize that disparate outcomes undermine equality and try to do something to address them. We blame the people, we blame the disparate outcomes on the individuals. Yes, right, you're not working hard enough. You're not taking advantage of what's you're, being offered to you. Right, lazy or stupid. And with the American exceptionalism is so much that, that people in this country don't even know that they are lacking those things from our constitution. They don't even know that because they think there's, that we're the best and that there's nothing we could learn from other places. And so, you know, there are actually people in this country who think that we have the best healthcare system in the world. We don't even have a healthcare system. We have like healthcare systems in lots of holes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But people think that we, they honestly do. There are people who don't understand that you could go to Western Europe. Oh, hold on. They're going to want me there in a minute. Um, but um, it's just five. So if you want to, we can round this up because I know you've got to. No, 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 no. We can't talk. Look, no, we're you know, we're both got... going to the same place after this. I know. <laughs> That's right. so they, they can't start without us. Okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And this is so interesting. I am so happy for this opportunity to learn from you. This is very oh, and, this and is so wonderful. Me from you, thank you. Yeah, but so, so there are people who, you know, like if they knew that, that you could have one year of paid maternal or paternal leave, you know, if they knew the things that we could have in other places, but it's completely discounted. It's like, there's no place better than this country. I think that's really a huge, uh, it's, a, it's a propaganda, it's a propaganda um, tool. So that people don't understand what else we could have. Is there, is there something that that you know the, the reader can do? What what can we do to address this? On this upper level with institutions, but is is there? A can you you you're away from your mic? Oh, Sorry. um, what can you know for the read, person reading this? What can we do to address this? You're, you're both working on the institutional level, but are there other actions that you know or you can recommend. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I just go through the, the things that I put at the end of my talk? Is that all right? Because sure. because I have like I, I say like what can we do today? And actually the image goes back to an image that I'm gonna sort of start with, which is an image of people who are basically born inside the restaurant, sitting at the table of opportunity eating. They look up, they see a sign that says open, and they don't even recognize there's a two-sided sign going on right? Because it's difficult for any of us to recognize the system of inequity that privileges us. But those on the outside are very well aware there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims closed to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So that's, that's from my dual reality restaurant saga. So, I'm, so that's kind of, so then at the end, these are the things that I suggest. I say, first of all, we all need to look act, to actively look for evidence of two-sided signs. Is there something differential going on here, wherever here is for you in your child's school or whatever? Is there something differential going on here by race or by gender or ethnicity or language or immigration status or urban, rural or religion? Or is there something differential going on here? The second thing is to burst through our burst, I guess, from our bubbles of experience to experience our common humanity in different settings. And so I'll go into that more um, in more detail. But it's, it's to understand that each of us in our bubbles, and we have big bubbles or little bubbles, but each of us is in a bubble. Often we don't recognize that just across town, there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances. So we need to create as individuals or as institutions, opportunities for us to burst through our bubbles, to experience our common humanity in different settings so that we can establish kind of common cause. The third is to be interested in the stories of others and then believe the stories of others without requiring cell phone documentation, right? That seems to be the only thing that makes people believe what's been going on for centuries, you know, the black folks in terms of lynchings. And then to join in the stories of others. So that's number three. The fourth is to um, develop a sensitivity to the absence of. So who's not at the table? What's not on the agenda? You know, like what things don't we know? 
um, what policies are not in place that have put in place could make things much better. The fifth, and all of these, I, when you'll see the slides, are from the point of view of people who are inside the restaurant. The fifth is to reveal inaction in the face of need. Because inaction, lack of action in the face of need is how structural racism most often manifests these days. And then I say, but all of the stuff to do is not just from the point of view of those inside the restaurant, that those of us on the outside need to know our power. We need to recognize that action is power. And I, I really believe that, that, um, that you won't get depressed if you're acting to, to dismantle like your oppressor, right? And then especially that collective action is power. So that's how I will end my talk tonight. And so those are the like, what can we do today? And like, and people can internalize those and act on those. I was really gonna speak to the point of collective action and grassroots uh, engagement uh, and right, taking ownership. I think a lot of us of all, you know, races and ethnicities, male, female, so we, there's a passivity that, you know, we sometimes fall into I can't do anything about this. This is hopeless, you know, the hopelessness. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that, for instance, when people refuse to engage, like they refuse to buy from certain retailers, they refuse to ride uh, the buses, as we saw back in the 1950s in Montgomery. We, you know, we have economic power. People, it's amazing how quickly things change when people stop engaging as consumers. Uh, uh, for for instance, and how quickly, interestingly, uh, corporate organizations have adapted to the changing cultural dynamics and the growing recognition of some of these problems in ways that the government has not or the uh, other institutions have not because they see that their consumers um, care and they don't want to lose those consumers. So we should take lessons from those, act, those uh, collective actions and think uh, more strategically about how we can band together across difference. Uh, because at the end of the day, we all are, as I often say, we are all disfigured, we are all undermined by racism in the society. It, it is, as it's, an, has its negative impacts on uh, the victims are more obvious, but the uh, negative impacts on those who are not victimized by it are not as obvious, but they are there. And, um, you know, this, uh, Martin Luther King spoke to this very eloquently, but many others have as well. We, we don't do, I don't think any of us want to live in a society that is, um, you, know, you know, disfigured and distorted by structural and systemic racism. Uh, but we have to take it upon ourselves then to, to address it. I want him to have the last word, but can I say something that can go before that last word? <laughs> so, so, so that's the last word. <laughs> But the thing that, that it stimulated me to say is that, and I may have said this earlier, but I don't think so, that there are four key messages when we're talking about racism. That racism exists, that racism is a system, that racism saps the strength of the whole society, and that we can act to dismantle racism. And whenever I talk about racism, I say these are the four key messages, if I'm equipping everybody listening to me today, these are the four key messages that every time you say racism, you need to be clear about those things. So. I think that is the last word. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. 